The razor's edge was ground from the German aerial sword by the hard and determined Russian armed forces. The struggle between Germany and Russia spanned 47 months. It involved tens of thousands of aircraft and hundreds of thousands of miles of territory. German expectations were high in June 1941. The Luftwaffe had finished the most massive of its redeployments. It had pulled resources from all over Europe to be poised along the borders of the Soviet Union. The Soviet Air Force, like all of Russia's armed forces, had suffered Stalin's paranoid purges in the 1930s. They deprived the Air Force of an astonishing 75% of its leadership. They also paralyzed the remaining leaders with a legitimate fear of the firing squad. Neither past heroism nor devotion to the party was considered. Stalin gained control of his armed forces by the simplest of means. He killed most of the leaders and terrified the rest. The reign of terror reached deep down within the Air Force. It took all corps and military district commanders. It took most of the divisional and brigade commanders. It even took half the regimental commanders. The madness also ravaged the Soviet aviation industry. It did even more damage there because there was a much smaller pool of replacements for the victims. Everyone was suspect. If an experimental aircraft didn't meet its design goals, sabotage was proclaimed. Bureau designers were imprisoned, including such major figures as A.N. Tupolev. The fear even extended to flying training. Pilots were reluctant to fly because they might have an accident and be accused of sabotage. In June 1941, the Soviet Air Force, the VVS, was divided into five components. The long-range Air Force of the High Command employed bombers and transports. France, for each military district, had fighter and short-range bomber divisions. There was a newly conceived composite division of fighters, bombers, and ground attack aircraft to support each land army. The Military Service Air Force, equivalent to observation units in other armies, was used for communications and liaison. The Soviets saw the Air Force as a substitute for or a component of the artillery. It might have served well in an offensive campaign where the Soviet Union maintained the initiative, but in the face of the German onslaught, it would prove to be terminally flawed. The Soviet Air Force almost caught the tide of equipment change perfectly. An accidental result of Stalin's purges was the establishment of new leaders of design bureaus to replace those who had become politically suspect. A series of new aircraft emerged with names that would become familiar to two generations of Western observers, Ilushin, Mikoyan, Gurevich, Yakovlev, and Lavochkin. But in June 1941, only a handful of the 4,000 fighters and bombers stationed at airfields within the reach of the Luftwaffe came from the new designers. The Polycarpov I-15 and I-16 were obsolete fighters from the early 30s. The I-15 was a biplane, and the I-16 was a monoplane. The Tupolev SB-2 was an obsolete bomber. In the first half of 1941, the first of a new wave of fighters appeared. There were modern, low-wing monoplanes with retractable landing gear and enclosed cockpits, but their designs were still not very satisfactory. None were equivalent to the Messerschmitt Bf-109Fs opposing them. The airplane that Stalin claimed was as vital as air or bread to the Soviet army was the Illusion Il-2. 
It became famous as the Sturmweg ground attack aircraft. The Germans would come to call it Black Death, and it would be built in quantities greater than any other warplane in history. The Il-2 was built as a single armored unit from the cockpit forward. Both engine and pilot were well protected. The rear of the fuselage was of wooden monocoque construction. The wings were all metal. Armament was heavy with two machine guns and two cannon. The only new bomber in the Soviet Air Force at the time of the German invasion was the Pitlikov P-2. It was an elegant twin-engine combination attack plane and dive bomber. In fact, the Soviet Union had achieved virtual parity with Germany in the performance of its major aircraft types. There was still room for development, and the Soviet Union was gearing up for a much higher level of production. But reports of Soviet air strength from responsible German leaders were ignored by the Luftwaffe intelligence. Hitler grandly titled the invasion of the Soviet Union Operation Barbarossa. It was named after Frederick I, Redbeard, who had marched into the Holy Land in the 11th century Crusades. Operation Barbarossa was Hitler's great crusade to achieve Lebensraum, living room for Germany. He planned a six-week campaign to destroy the Soviet armies with his tried and proved blitzkrieg techniques. After that, there would be a leisurely follow-up to prepare once again for an attack on Great Britain. Hitler's forces were massive. He had more than three million men in 162 divisions. The Luftwaffe had deployed 2,770 first-line aircraft out of its 4,300 total. The basic types of aircraft were the same as those employed in Western Europe and against Britain, but most were now the latest model. The fighter units had the Messerschmitt Bf 109 F2, perhaps the best of the long line of the 109 series. The bomber Staffeln had Junkers Ju 88As and Heinkel HE 111Hs. Early in the morning on June 22, 1941, 30 German bombers, Junkers, Dorniers, and Heinkels, crossed the Russian frontier at high altitude. As dawn broke, they attacked 10 Soviet airfields. The Soviet bases were completely unprepared for the attack. The aircraft were drawn up in long rows, wing to wing. They were perfect targets. When dawn broke, hundreds more German aircraft bombed and strafed another 66 Russian airfields. Even Hermann Göring could not believe the results of the attack. 1,800 Soviet aircraft were destroyed on the first day. The Germans lost 32 planes. Over the next four days, another 2,000 Soviet aircraft were destroyed. Thus began the killing that would allow the greatest aces of the Luftwaffe to run up victory scores of hundreds of aircraft. Ironically, it was Stalin who was the agent of this mass destruction. He had known about the German reconnaissance overflows. He had been warned by Britain that an attack was imminent. He had even been given the exact date of the attack. Yet, until the very end, he suppressed all attempts at readiness, hoping somehow to buy more time from the Germans. As the bombs rained down and the tanks raced forward, the bombers of the Soviet Air Force were ordered to strike the invading German forces. The inexperienced Soviet pilots flew in tight formations, maintaining their course and altitude. They were shut down in droves, often without even getting near the target. 
The situation was so desperate that the Soviet bombers were sent not only without fighter escort. Often, they had no gunners either. The lone pilots were more terrified of the firing squad than the Luftwaffe. The majority of the Soviet fighters were the stubby little I-16s that had just managed to survive against the early model Messerschmitts in the Spanish Civil War. Against the new Messerschmitts 109Fs, they had no chance at all. Most Russian pilots were inexperienced. Their tactics were poor. Their leadership was non-existent. With air superiority temporarily achieved, the German ground advance went like clockwork. The German forces pressed on in great slicing maneuvers that enveloped whole Soviet armies. In mid-July, Minsk fell. Smolensk fell a week later. Chief of the German general staff was General Franz Halder. He was not a supporter of Hitler, but he recorded in his diary that the campaign had been won in the first two weeks of battle. But he also wrote that for every dozen Soviet divisions destroyed, another dozen materialized as if from thin air. The slaughter in the sky continued. The Luftwaffe ground crews demonstrated their proficiency at using advanced airfields to support the bombers and fighters. Dive bomber pilots routinely flew from dawn to dusk. They flew a dozen sorties a day. Their missions were 15 minutes over, bomb and strafe, then 15 minutes back to rearm for another attack with their engines running. Yet the incredible mobility of the Luftwaffe was also a sign of its weakness. Like a too small blanket, pulling it to one section of the front merely uncovered another sector. Units that had swarmed towards Smolensk in July were switched to the Leningrad front in August, then to Kiev in September. In the midst of the chaos, the Russians manufactured a miracle. They moved almost 1,500 industrial facilities of the aviation industry almost brick by brick to new locations behind the Ural Mountains. The 10 million members of the workforce rode on freight trains with the equipment. The conditions were subhuman. Aircraft were again coming down production lines and these production lines were now safely out of reach of German bombers. During the move, aircraft production fell by 30%, but within 90 days it had increased above previous levels. It was some time before quality caught up, but at least the airplanes were coming. As time passed, the German penetration spread out. It became deeper and wider along all three main axes of attack. Then it began to wane for lack of supplies. Hitler did not press the attack on Moscow in August. He waited, vacillating about what to do next. He waited for six critical weeks from mid-August until October the 1st, 1941. Then he ordered an all-out attack on Moscow. The Luftwaffe had gathered 1,320 aircraft in Luftflotte II. 
the experienced German airland team surged forward. Two Panzer armies tore the Red Army apart so effectively that all communication with Moscow was lost. But the offensive bogged down in the torrential rains of November. The Russian roads became a sea of mud, impassable to wheeled vehicles. Difficulties in supply and Hitler's greediness to conquer more territory than originally planned brought the massive campaign to a halt. New demands from the Mediterranean theater now forced Hitler into a major blunder. To meet Rommel's requirements against the Allies in North Africa, he transferred Luftflotte II to Sicily. The timing could not have been worse. It deprived the German army facing Moscow of the air power it so desperately needed. The German offensive reached to within 19 miles of Moscow. Then it died in its tracks. A Russian aerial strength grew. The Soviet Air Force flew 51,000 sorties in defense of Moscow. 45,000 of them were in ground attack. The Soviet army began a massive Russian counter-offensive on December 5th on a 560-mile front from Yelets to Kalinin. In the worst winter for 20 years, the German Air Force watched its strength dwindle in a nightmare of shortages and malfunctions. Only 15% of the 100,000 Luftwaffe vehicles in Russia were operational. German combat aircraft stood hangarless in open fields. They were cold soaked for days in sub-zero weather. They could only be started by desperate means, including building an open fire under the engine. The few heaters and blowers meant to warm engines, were used instead to free mechanics' hands, frozen to their tools. But unlike the German army, at least the Luftwaffe personnel had winter clothes. Luftwaffe strength in Russia dropped to 500 operational planes. The Russians had 1,000 planes operating from good fields on the Moscow front alone. The Soviet Air Force was well used to cold weather it continued to function. For the first time, its aircraft could operate with impunity. They supported the advance of the ground forces and kept the relatively few German sorties from reaching their targets. Through January and February 1942, the Soviets attacked all along the front, regaining large amounts of territory. The disaster at Moscow made one fact clear to the Germans. Even Hitler realized that the number of aircraft being produced for the Luftwaffe was insufficient. The German aviation industry now became a system of rings of small factories making components. These components were then assembled in huge factories. The spring thaw of 1942 immobilized even the Russians. Hitler decided to make a small-scale attack on Leningrad. But he would concentrate most of his forces for an attack to the south. There he hoped to gain control of the Soviet oil fields in the Caucasus and obtain the oil supplies he needed so desperately. Hitler had lost almost half his entire invasion force. The loss of vehicles was so great that many mechanized divisions were no longer mobile. Germany turned again to horses, using more than three million. Production efforts intensified. Resources were shifted from other fronts, 
51 divisions from satellite countries were incorporated into the German army. Strength was built up for the attack on the Caucasus. It was an impossible task for the means Hitler had in hand. His senior advisors recommended a pullback. Relatively, the Luftwaffe was in better shape than the army. Its strength had been rebuilt to 2,750 aircraft, almost the number it had before the invasion. Hitler continued to leave the operations of the Luftwaffe alone. He selected the objectives, but allowed the Luftwaffe commanders to run their own show. For almost two months, it appeared that Hitler might be right after all. Sevastopol fell with 150,000 prisoners. German tanks gobbled up miles of territory, but very few Russians. The Soviet army had learned from previous campaigns and now pulled back where necessary. Hitler's interpretation was that the Soviet army was disintegrating and had no more men to lose. Again, the Luftwaffe wrought havoc with the Soviet air force. There was a substantial change in air operations. There was less emphasis on close air support, more was placed on long-range bombers attacking Russian formations behind the lines. But Hitler became greedy. He expanded the original southern thrust and split it into three directions. One went east to Stalingrad. Another went west to the Black Sea. A third pushed south to Baku on the Caspian Sea. Hitler began to intervene more deeply in the operation of the army. Not content with being chief of state, commander-in-chief of the armed forces and commander-in-chief of the army, he now assumed command of Army Group A, the one pushing for the Caspian Sea. Army Group B began the attack on Stalingrad on August 10, 1942. Resistance stiffened quickly. It became apparent that the Russians were going to make a stand. The Luftwaffe began concentrating its aircraft in this area, building to a strength of 1,000. Stalingrad was a city of half a million people on a great bend in the Volga River. It was a major railroad center and had huge tank and armament factories. Its site made it a natural fortress. It was protected by hills rising out of the flat plains to the west. The Germans penetrated the burnt out wooden edges of the city. Here they entered a world of broken brick factories. They joined bitter hand-to-hand -hand battles, not for a mile of land, but for a room or a storeyard. The Germans called this basement-to-basement -basement struggle Rattenkrieg, the War of the Rats. At first, the Germans outnumbered the defenders of Stalingrad three to one. They had far more armor and artillery. But the Soviets simply would not give up. By enduring, they triumphed. Marshal Georgi Zhukov, who had saved Moscow, kept the numbers of Russians within Stalingrad at a minimum. All the while, he readied vast forces for a massive counterattack. Shukov's German counterpart, General Friedrich von Paulus, played directly into Shukov's hands. He threw his army against the rough barricades by frontal tactics. These included sending infantry in front of the tanks to draw fire and reveal the Soviet positions. In the early stage, the standard Luftwaffe ground attack tactics worked well. 
but eventually there were a few identifiable targets to hit. One clump of rubble resembled another, and the Soviet troops scampered between them like malevolent mice. The Luftwaffe might have made a difference if it had been employed in the interdiction of Soviet supply lines. From early August, all available Luftwaffe elements were fully employed in the battle for Stalingrad. By October 1942, the Luftwaffe Junkers Ju-52s had already flown 21,500 sorties. They had carried 43,000 tons of troops, fuel and equipment. Marshal Zhukov lured the German 6th Army ever deeper within the city of Stalingrad. He saw that the weakest link in the enemy front was the northern sector, held by the Romanian army. Against them, Zhukov concentrated a great force. There were half a million infantry troops. There were 230 regiments of artillery. There were 900 T-34 tanks, the best in the world at the time. For the first time since the start of the summer offensive, the Soviet Air Force now reached numerical superiority over the Luftwaffe. It had 1,500 planes against the Luftwaffe's 1,200. More than 60% of them were the hard-hitting Sturmovik attack aircraft and two of the most important Soviet fighters, the Lovichkin Lov-5 and the Yakovlev Yak-9. Both were faster, more maneuverable, and had a greater rate of climb than the Messerschmitt. Stalin had insisted that the Il-2 Sturmovik, originally a two-seater, be made a single-seat aircraft. Now he permitted the introduction of an improved two-seat design. It was a costly surprise to the Germans. For a brief period, they continued to make tail attacks at it, unaware of the stinger in the rear cockpit. Operation Uranus, the Soviet counterattack at Stalingrad, began on November 19, 1942. The massive Soviet forces brushed the Romanians aside and swept south. One day later, a southern pincer swept first west and then north. Within five days, the Germans were entombed in Stalingrad. Hitler immediately proclaimed Stalingrad to be a fortress. Göring pledged that his Luftwaffe could deliver the 750 tons of supplies a day that were necessary to support the German army. It was an optimistic promise. Reality soon forced the target down to 500 tons a day. It was just enough to maintain the trapped armies, but not enough to sustain them in combat. The senior officers of the army and the Luftwaffe said it was an impossible task. They suggested that General von Paulus should fight his way west to meet a German relief force. Hitler rejected the suggestion. Having said the city was captured, he would not give it up. 850 transport aircraft were assembled for the relief effort. Junkers Ju-52s formed the bulk of the fleet. But there were also Heinkel HE-111s, which were badly needed for bombing duties. And there was a ragtag collection of anything else that could fly. But in Stalingrad, there were no adequate landing fields, no normal approach lights, no radio facilities, no handling and storage equipment. There was plenty of bad weather, and an ever-increasing quantity of Soviet anti-aircraft guns, and there were more and better Soviet aircraft. The Soviet Air Force had also been drastically reorganized. It was now made up of 13 mobile air armies, 
each was controlled by an air commander who could work with any army commander to whose front he was assigned. The air armies were composite forces of fighter, bomber, and ground attack aircraft. Each air army was outfitted with sufficient support equipment for sustained independent operation. Behind these mobile air armies was the Reserve Air Corps. It brought new aircraft and air crews to a central area for training and dispatch to combat units. In effect, the Luftwaffe offensive action over Stalingrad served the unintended function of training the Soviet Air Force. As more and more Soviet aircraft were dedicated to the Stalingrad theater, the pilots became adept at countering German tactics. The Soviets planned to counter the German airlift by an aerial blockade. A series of concentric circles was drawn around the German forces. In the outer circle, two entire air armies were dedicated to intercepting incoming German aircraft. Any German transports would have to fly over this circle at some point. The second circle closely surrounded the trapped Germans. Inside it was an anti-aircraft zone that could put up a veritable curtain of fire. The area between the first and second circles was divided into five sectors. Each one had airfields for bombers and fighters. The task of the Luftwaffe in penetrating this blockade was virtually impossible. But the Germans set about it with vigor. In the Luft is Every day, German fighters contested the Soviet Air Force for air superiority in the narrow corridor used by the transports. The German transports were loaded at airfields far to the west of Stalingrad. The last leg of their journey into the German pocket was a flight of about 120 miles. In ideal conditions, the Germans might have been able to supply between 250 and 300 tons daily. But the weather went from bad to worse. Takeoff and landing points became strewn with wrecked aircraft. Soviet fighters looked on the Ju-52s as cold meat. Even the Sturmovics turned from tank busting to hunting transports. By December, only 100 tons a day were reaching the trapped Germans. By January, all the airfields inside the German pocket had been captured by the Russians. Throughout the battle, the Soviet Air Force became increasingly aggressive. They harassed the German transports in spite of their fighter escorts. They struck out to attack the German takeoff points. They fought by night and day. Polycarp of PO2 biplanes, many of them piloted by women, droned endlessly over the lines, dropping small bombs. The women who flew these PO2s became known as the night witches. Women also flew fighters. They were more involved in combat than the women of any other country. The Soviet Air Force overwhelmed the Luftwaffe, flying twice as many missions as the Germans. The tide of the air war had turned in terms of equipment, numbers, and even training. Between the German invasion in June 1941 and February 1943, the Soviet Union built 41,000 aircraft. It trained 131,000 aircrew members and the Soviets had caught the tide of technical change in the midst of the war. The aircraft flowing from the factories were all new types. They were to be used with new tactics the Soviets were learning from the Germans.
The Germans in Stalingrad surrendered on January 3, 1943. Almost 160,000 of the 284,000 men in the pocket had died in the miserable cold and filth of the city. In the air, they lost 495 transports and 200 fighters. The Luftwaffe was now like a hemorrhaging patient. It was sustained only by the continuous infusion of new blood. Its strength was maintained and even increased by new planes and new crews. But the new crews died within days of their arrival. The Iron Corps of veterans became more expert even as they became smaller in number. These old stages had more combat experience than any flyers in any air force in World War II. They survived because they were good and lucky. The disruption to the Luftwaffe of the Stalingrad campaign was very great. So much so that after Stalingrad had fallen, strength could be directed elsewhere. For a while, the ailing Luftwaffe seemed to gain new life. But for all essential purposes, the air war in Russia was decided. There would still be 27 months more of hard fighting, but the issue was no longer in doubt. The Soviet Air Force grew better every day. It learned from the Germans and developed its own specialized techniques. But the Luftwaffe continued to do well. This was due to men like General Wolfram von Richthofen. He established a unified command over the whole of the Southern Front. The Luftwaffe's mode of operation was about to change. From having the initiative, able to operate offensively, it was now forced into a defensive posture. Now it would do what it had to do, which was to provide army support. And then it would degenerate again until it was in a position to only do what its limited strength permitted. From April 17th to June 7th, 1943, a relatively obscure but important battle took place on the Kuban Peninsula of the North Caucasus. It ended in a stalemate on the ground, but in the air, the Russians demonstrated for the first time a parity with the Luftwaffe in terms of aircraft performance, tactics, and individual pilot ability. Given that Soviet aircraft production was far outstripping that of Germany, this could only mean disaster for the Germans. The Russians deployed 800 aircraft. Most were the new generation Soviet fighters. But for the first time, a sizable number of land lease aircraft were present. There were B-25 bombers and P-39 fighters from America. And there were supermarine Spitfires from Britain. By this time, the Soviet Union had received more than 3,000 planes, 2,400 tanks, and 80,000 vehicles via land lease. Over the Kuban, the Soviet ace, Alexander Pakrishkin, adapted the two- and four-plane German fighter formations for Soviet use. He insisted on tight discipline and on closing to short range for firing. 
he introduced vertical maneuvering into the Russian tactics. Pakrishkin scored 20 of his 59 victories in the Kuban campaign, flying a Bell P-39 Air Cobra. By late 1944, the Luftwaffe situation on the Eastern Front had deteriorated so badly that the Luftwaffe could no longer win even local air superiority when it concentrated all its available forces. The Russian enemy had become too strong and too skilled. Like a losing poker player who has no choice except to play the final hand, Hitler allowed himself to undertake a last great offensive. Hitler had doubts about Operation Citadel and his generals advised him against it. The 1942 winter offensive had resulted in a huge salient in the German lines around Kursk, a small city 300 miles south of Moscow. Although his resources were limited, Hitler knew that he held a wolf by the ears. He realized that he must retain the initiative and score a last great victory before the Russian buildup inevitably swamped him. The Kursk salient was huge, 100 miles wide and 150 miles long. Hitler decided on an attack that would pinch it off. The removal of the Kursk salient was an attempt to shorten the front lines and savage a large concentration of Russian armies. The Russians had time to prepare eight concentric rings of defenses. They were eager to have the Germans wear themselves down upon it and then counterattack. Within their eight rings, the Russians had nine field armies, 20,000 artillery pieces, and 920 Katyusha rocket projectors. As the battle opened, the Soviet Air Force had almost 2,900 planes. More than 1,000 of them were fighters and 940 were Sturmoviks. The Luftwaffe had drawn from other sectors of the front and from the west. It had built up surprising strength. It had almost 2,000 aircraft, but only 600 of them were fighters. The first day of the Kursk battle was almost like the happy hunting days at the beginning of Operation Barbarossa. The Luftwaffe won by a tremendous margin. At the end of the first day, 432 Russian planes were claimed versus a loss of 173. There were corresponding victories on the Russian side. The later Sturmoviks decimated the Panzer divisions with circle of death tactics. The Sturmoviks would circle over a German tank column so that the attack was directed at the thin-skinned rear of the tanks. Pass after pass would be made until all the tanks were destroyed or their ammunition was gone. For eight long hours, the greatest tank battle in history was fought. Each side was aided by its attack planes. When evening fell, the Germans crept away from the battlefield. The Battle of Kursk had been a titanic struggle. Two million men, 5,000 aircraft, and 6,000 tanks were engaged. The prepared Soviet defenses, the minefields and the tanks, held up the German panzers. Vastly improved control of Sturmoviks and fighters by radio helped the Soviet Air Force overpower the Luftwaffe. At 
at Kursk, it was obvious that the day of Blitzkrieg was over for the Germans, but it was just beginning for Russia. After the Battle of Kursk, the Soviet Union never relaxed the pressure. It kept pressing forward with a series of offensives somewhere in the winter that kept the Germans entirely on the defensive. Luftwaffe had no margins of reserve. It was switched from point to point along the front to meet Soviet initiatives. It was totally subordinated to the Army's immediate emergency needs. By the time the red tide rolled toward Berlin, the Soviet Army was protected by no less than 7,500 aircraft on that front alone. It was faced by just 400 Luftwaffe fighters. The Soviet Air Force was now in a position to employ air power as the Russian army had traditionally employed artillery in massive quantities and without regard to losses. In hindsight, it is clear there is little the Luftwaffe could have done against the Soviet Union to change the outcome of the struggle on the Eastern Front. Hitler's reckless gamble in attacking the Soviet Union embroiled his country in a war that could not be won. The Luftwaffe performed its tactical role almost flawlessly throughout the war, even under the most difficult circumstances. But the odds against it were overwhelming. At last, the edge of Hitler's Luftwaffe sword was blunted. 